From Indy's streaming news leader, this is breaking news from WRTV. And that breaking news is a deadly shooting investigation on Indy's east side. This is near Dearborn Street and Michigan Street, and you're looking at a live picture from the scene right now. IMPD was called out to the scene, and they found one victim with injuries consistent of a gunshot wound. That person was found dead at the scene. Again, our crew is on the scene working to figure out if there are any other details we can share with you this morning. We will keep you updated over there on the east side. As we follow that, the other big story this morning, of course, is your forecast. As people People are still waiting for the potential. The any kind of sign mm -hmm. of precipitation would be welcome. But is there any on the forecast? I mean, it's still very limited. Some uh, lucky few could get in okay. on rain. But as we go a little deeper into the forecast, those rain chances will improve here on Sunday and about Monday. So we'll talk more about that here in a second. This morning, it's dry. That is good for your morning commute, of course. We've got temperatures out there that are running a little bit cooler than the last couple of mornings. 64 right now in Lafayette. We've got temperatures that are in the upper 50s in Richmond. It's 66 in downtown Indianapolis. And there you can see we got a lot of cloud cover. We wish we could just squeeze some of that moisture out of those clouds, but you've got an isolated shower, really just a couple of sprinkles around the Seymour area this morning, and our rain chances remaining very limited limited as the parent system here remains over the southeast. So we just continue to get kind of grazed by this more clouds than anything else and a bit of a temperature spread. So we'll call for a high of 78 in Indianapolis today, but we are going to see temperatures a little closer to the lower 80s around Lafayette, mid 70s as you work your way toward Richmond and also Columbus. There's a look at the rain chances. You can see they get to about 40 and 50% by Sunday and Monday. And while that's not a sure thing, it's certainly better than what we've had lately, Lauren. All right, Kyle. Well, another big story this morning. Look at this beautiful sight. And I'm not talking about that sunrise there on the horizon. I'm talking about traffic moving on eastbound I-465 here on the south side and southwest side. This has been closed for several weeks now here in the month of June. This morning, just around 5 a.m., crews reopened eastbound I-465 between I-70 and I-65. And that says that this was on schedule to open open today before the morning rush hour and it is so all those ramps are open. You can use this area, so that is great news. Our live drive vehicle is out and about on eastbound I-465 showing you that newly opened roadway. This is still an active construction zone, so keep that in mind as you out there traveling this morning to watch for any workers who are left over still making some minor adjustments there to the interstate. Enjoy this while it lasts. We'll have the westbound direction closing in early July. We'll keep you updated on that ongoing project. It is good to see that progress. It has been a busy morning so far here in central Indiana. At the time now is 603. A federal operation by law enforcement is ho hoping to get a handle on gun related violence right here in 317, 765 and 812. It's being called Operation North Star. Within 48 hours of rolling out this strategic plan, officials say the operation led to the capture of one of the U.S. Marshals 15 most wanted. We're talking about 26 year old Joshua Smiley, who was taken into custody. I will point out that there's 188 people in jail right now charged with murder, and very few of them surrendered themselves. So, important enforcement actions like this today is what gets the people off the street. That was the Barron County Sheriff. The first two phases of Operation North Star resulted in the closing of more than 2,600 warrants and 230 homicide cases. Well, residents on the south side are raising safety concerns about a proposed truck stop near their homes. That truck stop would be built near South Harding Street and State Road 37. You can see the area there on your map. According to the proposal, the truck stop's driveway would be in front of homes on South Harding, which is also a two-lane road. James Klinger lives nearby and says this area already has a lot of traffic and a lot of semi crashes. It's more of a residential area. There's people here. We have kids. We have dogs. We have um, just, you know, this is our home. Trucks have a hard time negotiating this small uh, street here. And uh, it, we have three truck stops already, Pilot, Flying J, and uh, Mr. Fuel. And all those trucks, their entrances are on a four-lane road or a uh, six-lane road. 
Well, a report from the Metropolitan Development Commission says the area should not be rezoned to build this truck stop. The developer appealed that decision, and now a commission appointed by the city will have to decide. That commission is expected to make a final decision on July 19th. The time now is 6.05, and new this morning, new scanners at Indianapolis International for your carry-on luggage or your bags will provide federal agents a better picture of what's inside things like this. I'll show you in a moment how to move through the process better in light of those new scanners. But first, the manpower and the new machines. Olivia Wells graduated from Indiana State University with dreams of public service and founded in a blue uniform at the airport. I flew all the time, but I had no idea what this job entails. The Linton native among the many TSA officers on the front lines of aviation safety. More people in bags are showing up at checkpoints as vacation season takes off. At Indianapolis International, new scanners known as computed tomography or CT are at work. We are the first state to have this piece of equipment at every security lane, every checkpoint. Um, there are some lessons learned that come with being the first. Um, we've learned that uh, lighter items uh, you know, have to be at the bottom. Uh, we've learned that the divest officer, the person giving the instructions to the travelers, is probably the most important pos uh, position uh, among all of our team because if they don't uh, communicate that effectively to the travelers, um, it causes the machine to fault, um, which then causes us about three minutes to reset it, uh, which then slows up the process. The bottom line, this is about you and the people who work here at IND, allowing the workforce to see exactly what is on that carry-on luggage to make sure that everything that's there belongs there and that your flight and you are safe. Taking a closer look, the new technology provides detailed images similar to what doctors get when you undergo an x-ray on a serious matter. For TSA officers, more details to make better decisions an improvement from the previous system in detecting what someone may be trying to hide. We would see something inside of the bag on a 2D image and we weren't able to manipulate it and we thought it was a threat so we would pull it, right? So we would pull that bag for a second inspection, which then in turn takes time away from the passenger getting to their flight, getting to their coffee. And so now that we are able to manipulate the images and guarantee that isn't a threat, we're not waiting for the bags on the other side. The most difficult thing about this job is complacency. Um, here at Indianapolis, we see 16,000 people uh, going through our security checkpoints every day. And usually 16,000 people aren't intending to do um, you know, harm uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the aircraft or the airport. Um, as you mentioned, we have to get it right every time. They only have to get it right once. Um, and what this machine will allow us to do is in the future, not look at all 16,000 uh, images, uh, but maybe only look at a fraction of those images um, that might alarm the equipment. So therefore we can focus uh, our resource and time on more specific items versus everyone. Now at 6.07 there at IND, the, the largest chunk of flights begin to depart as we speak. Mm -hmm. By the way, TSA does admit that the initial installation of those new scanners, they're big, caused some delays at the airport. Those delays have been addressed. Okay, so if I'm going to the airport, I have things like iPad, laptop, maybe a cell phone, devices, anything different I need to do with these items. Here's the changes with the new scanners. So it used to be that you'd have to take all that stuff out of your bag. And now mm -hmm. you can put all that stuff, keep it in your bag. So when you approach the bins, we're going to use this bin as an example, right? Just put it all in the bag. But here's what changes. Mm -hmm. When you take off your shoes, your shoes, mm -hmm. and maybe your jacket go in first. All the stuff, the soft stuff goes in first. Mm -hmm. Then you plop in the uh, the bag and then you okay. send it through the machine. By the way, you still got to take off your belt. And <laughs> for heaven's sakes, the water, throw out the well. water. Otherwise, you're going to slow down the checkpoint <laughs> process, right? So keep that in mind. We'll put this all online on WRTV.com. But some changes, they're minimal, but hopefully they'll improve not only the process of getting through the checkpoints, but most importantly, these scanners are all about safety, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that they figure out what shouldn't be in the bag. Right. We want to be safe. safe. We want to be efficient get to our place on time. Raphael, thanks for looking into this so we can all be prepared next time we head to the airport. It is 609 though. The city of Fishers once again delaying improvements on State Road 37 and 141st Street. The reason city officials say remains that rising costs and also inflation. The 141st Street interchange is the last portion of this project that needs to be complete. Fishers recently announced plans to add a new community center and more apartments. Residents want to make sure that the needs of everyone in Fishers are being met. Very focused on the difference between what citizens need to have and what's nice to have. 
And it would be great if we could afford them all, but certainly the priorities need to be what we need to have for our citizens. Well, the city of Fishers says the projects come out of different budgets. Officials will now wait until next spring to seek a bidder to complete the State Road 37 project. Still ahead on this Thursday morning, new numbers on how students are performing in schools. What's the blame behind the plunging test scores? And experts say that missing submersible in the Atlantic will run out of air sometime this morning. The latest on the search for the five people on board, Kyle. All right, and it is a Thursday morning. That means we will be getting the updated drought monitor around 8 a.m. Last week's already had that moderate drought spreading in around Indianapolis and the northwestern half of central Indiana. We need a lot of rain. Looks like we're only going to get a little bit of rain. This is over the next seven days, a quarter of an inch of rain or less. We'll talk about when those rain chances will ramp up a bit. You're watching Good Morning Indiana. It is 610 here on your Thursday morning. Good morning to Brownsburg, Bloomington, and Bargersville. These are the top stories developing right now at 613. Former President Donald Trump's legal team has started receiving evidence from the Justice Department in the Classifieds Documents case. The evidence includes transcripts of grand jury testimony and copies of surveillance footage. It also contains multiple recordings, including a 2021 tape recording of Mr. Trump allegedly admitting to keeping a classified document about Iran. The man accused of leaking military secrets has pleaded not guilty to federal charges. It came just days after the 21-year-old Air National Guardsman was indicted by a grand jury. He's been behind bars since April for allegedly posting classified materials on the Internet. He now faces six counts of willful retention and transmission of national defense information. And President Biden getting ready to address several issues today with the Prime Minister of India. They will deliver remarks and take questions from reporters this afternoon. Human rights abuses in India are expected to be a major topic, along with India's close-knit ties to Russia amid the ongoing war in Ukraine. Later in the day, the Indian Prime Minister Mr. Modi will address Congress and be welcomed to the White House for an official state dinner. Well, the average math and reading test scores among middle schoolers have plummeted. That's according to a new report of a federal test known as the nation's report card. The data shows that scores among 13 year olds fell to their lowest levels in decades. Math scores dropped by nine points from 2020 to 2023, while reading scores fell by four points. Experts say the findings are a result of learning loss caused by the pandemic. At 6.15, let's check in with Kyle Mounts and our weather for today. Beautiful sunrise out there, Kyle. Yeah, you know, it just keeps getting better out there as mm -hmm. we look from IMS. And so we got to stick with it here and follow this sunrise through and enjoy this because we'll have some gray skies as we go through the afternoon. Right now it's 66 downtown and in Bloomington. You got 61 in Noblesville and 64. Your temperature to start off your Thursday in Lafayette. Winds are fairly light out there. We've got an east to northeast wind between about 5 and 10 miles per hour across mainly the eastern half of central Indiana. We also have the clouds as we look down to the south and east. That's where we find the rain. We got to go all the way down into Tennessee this morning and the Carolinas to find any wet weather. Truecast shows that we're not going to get much of a share of that wet weather today either. You can see just isolated shower and more rain that tries to make its way into central Indiana, but it looks like Ohio will kind of steal that away from us. So as we plan out your Thursday here, a lot of cloud cover that holds our temperatures pretty steady as we go through the first half of your day. We'll spend the morning in the 60s. We'll get to about 73 here at noon and later today, middle to upper 70s for an afternoon high. So for some areas, these numbers are going to be about 10 degrees below average for this time of year. And it's again going to be cooler as we work our way south and east. Our weather has been kind of flip flop this week. Typically we find the cooler temperatures as we travel north and west, but not today. 80 in Lafayette, 82 Rockville, about 75 in Greenwood. And we get to the middle 70s around Columbus at 74. True cast for the end of the week here on Friday. More cloud cover around a slightly better chance of a shower or an isolated downpour pour here, but that's really going to be across the eastern half of central Indiana. So areas that have seen more sunshine this week, 
likely to see more sunny skies tomorrow and not a drop of rain. The Friday planning forecast isolated shower out there. Otherwise, those mostly cloudy skies temperatures will get a degree or two warmer than what we're expecting today as we get back to around 80 degrees. The muggy meter, it takes a little bit of a break here. We'll be pretty comfortable through the afternoon today. It rises again on Friday. There you can see it kind of bounces around, but surges on Sunday, and that is going to be our next best chance for some rainfall. Here's a look at the next few days of your forecast, and we continue mainly dry, very limited rain chances as those temperatures make it to 88 on Saturday, 87 on Sunday. So Sunday will be a little bit of a steamy day with some of those afternoon showers and storms, and then more scattered storms on Monday. It looks like our best chance at some widespread rain. That will move out of here. We get back into a dry stretch of weather with highs in the low 80s through the middle of next week. Lauren? All right, Kyle, let's take it down here to the south side. A live look at I-465 and Madison Avenue. You can see traffic moving along up to speed, both eastbound and westbound. Again, that's a change for your commute this morning. Eastbound I-465 reopened completely around the 5 o'clock hour. So traffic through the area has been moving along just fine. No major issues, so that's great news. Our live drive vehicle is on eastbound I-465 right now. We're just east of Harding Street. We can see it is ongoing construction. So just use caution as you head through the area. Follow the lane markings, and we'll keep you updated as the westbound direction is set to close on July 7th. Well, now let's talk about that increasingly urgent rescue mission this morning to find the missing submersible in the North Atlantic Ocean. Five people are on board. Experts now estimating that that crew could run out of oxygen sometime this morning. As ABC News reports, rescuers hope that the underwater sounds that they're hearing may help them narrow that search. This morning, amid a rapidly depleting oxygen supply, it's a critical time for rescuers to find the five people on board the missing submersible called Titan, which disappeared on its way to the Titanic wreckage site Sunday. Experts estimate the crew will run out of oxygen sometime this morning. The U.S. Coast Guard had tried pinpointing repetitive banging sounds picked up on sonar equipment, but came up empty-handed. Navy experts now analyzing those sounds. We need to have hope, right? But, but I don't, I can't tell you what the noises are. This comes amid a growing international rescue effort as more ships and aerial crafts rush to the area where the sub vanished, covering an area twice the size of Connecticut. The French coming equipped with deep sea robots that are able to free the sub if it were stuck, though it wouldn't be able to lift it to the surface. On board, Ocean Gate's founder Stockton Rush, as well as a British billionaire and adventurous, a Pakistani businessman and his son, and a world-renowned Titanic researcher. Veteran explorer say the crew's conditions are dire if they're on the ocean floor where temperatures are below freezing. Your body uh, will start shivering uh, to generate heat and uh, that will use up more oxygen. So that's not a good thing. And now new claims that bureaucracy may have delayed life-saving efforts to find Titan. According to National Geographic, the deep sea exploration company, the Explorers Club, tried sending special underwater drones shortly after news broke about the sub, but was told by government officials to stand down. They have been reaching out to U.S. authorities and saying that there is a concern about how to retrieve this vessel if they could find it. The Coast Guard has since confirmed one of those drones is now en route. After the sub lost communication on Sunday, experts question why the Titan didn't trigger a buoyancy device and float to the top, hypothesizing that it wasn't just a communication failure. M1, ABC News, Washington. We have a local connection to this on this topic as an underwater robot is helping in the search for that missing watercraft. Experts from Purdue University say there's some challenges that those types of robots really face in underwater exploration. exploration. We spoke with an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Purdue. She says the main challenge surrounding the missing submersible is the depth. Right now there's not many robots that can operate deep in the ocean at 4,000 meters deep. That's the depth where the submersible was last detected. Uh, we are dealing with deep ocean, so deep ocean is hard to deal with anyways. And uh, when you pass 1,000 meter depth, you don't have sunlight. So it is dark and it is cold. So it, a lot of equipment might not work there. So that, that's the challenge right now. Professor, thanks for putting that in perspective. She hopes the technology in the future with underwater robots will advance since there's so much, she says, we don't know about the ocean floor. 
a seal of approval that could impact what lands on your dinner plate. How the chicken you could eventually buy could come from a lab. Mm, okay, mm. let's talk about that. <laughs> and a consumer warning for job seekers, how you can tell whether a posting is an actual scam. So of course, you don't waste your money. You're watching Good Morning Indiana. So check this out, you're all invited. I'm gonna buy this thing. $250 million for a house. Oh, not that much, just maybe just a <laughs> pool. This is for a Georgian classical mansion in the famed Los Angeles community of Bel Air is for sale and the price tag is a quarter of a billion dollars. I should have read the script earlier, making it the most expensive home for sale in America. But listen, this is not your ordinary house. No, no, this is something for Kyle Mounts. It features 60 rooms, which includes a massive dining room, a card room, a pool bar, and a screening room. The property also includes tennis and basketball courts. And by the way, the house was also the highest priced home when it sold in 1980 and again in the year 2000. Kyle, mm. if you just, I could name the elevator after me or something. I don't know, maybe the walkway. The maybe you can walkway. rent part of a room I mean, for a rent. day. I guess Thank you, Kyle. each of the dogs would have their own room and then some. I mean, they could invite their dog friends. Am oh. I watching the dogs? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. watching the dogs. Mm -hmm. Oh, what the heck? So. Yeah, I mean, look at the beautiful grounds. You <laughs> can walk them around, all right? That grass. You can play a little That's tennis. Awesome. <laughs> we'll invite Kevin Gregory over. Sure. Can play yep. some tennis. Sure. Yep. Sounds like a good deal. All I mean, right, nice. sounds like I'm going to be working a long time. <laughs> yeah, All right, right, let's look at the temperatures across the country. You know, if you've got some traveling today, we've talked about how hot it's been across areas like Texas, and that is not going to be changing today. The weather alerts across the country, they continue with excessive heat warnings there. That area of rain across the southeast, flood concerns there, and then you can see some stormy conditions in portions of Colorado this morning. Also, the tropics are very active here. We've got Tropical Storm Brett and newly formed Tropical Depression 4 right behind that. So if you've got some travel plans, the good news for you is that Brett looks like it will weaken as it moves a little closer to the Gulf of Mexico and also moving kind of due west as we go through the upcoming weekend. But we'll talk more about our weather here locally and some of those rain chances in just a bit, Rafael. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much. We all want to hear about the rain. So, uh, but listen, please, this morning there's a new warning out if you're going to look for a job, maybe change a job here in the near future. Consumer reporter John Matteries gives us more information about job scammers and how to avoid them so you don't waste your money. Looking for a new job this summer? Well, watch out. The Better Business Bureau says job scams are worse than ever this year and could cost you thousands of dollars. The BBB says the problem is that so many people are hunting for jobs they can do at home on their laptop. So scammers are posting thousands of fake job listings from companies that don't exist on legitimate employment websites. The BBB has reports of $840,000 in losses in just the first three months of this year. The median amount of money lost per person, $1,500. So do your homework. The Better Business Bureau says if you can't find any report about a company, there's a good chance it might be a scam. And be suspicious if they send you a check for any reason before you start working, that check is usually fake. To be safe, never pay money for any sort of work up front. That we don't waste your money. I'm John Matteris. Good morning, Indiana. From Indie Streaming News Leader, this is breaking news from WRTV. And we continue to follow that deadly shooting investigation taking place right now on Indy's east side. This is a live look from our photographer there at the scene. You're looking near Dearborn Street and Michigan Street on the east side. A call came in around 415 this morning of a person shot. When police arrived at the scene, they found an adult male inside of a vehicle with a gunshot wound. That adult male was pronounced dead at the scene. The vehicle was found in an alley just east of the 500 block of North North Dearborn Street. That investigation is still very active at this hour and we'll keep you updated as we get any new details. The other big story of the morning. This will impact you if you are driving along the south side. Check it out. Eastbound I-465 is finally back open on the southwest and south sides. It reopened around 5 a.m. this morning on schedule. You can use all the ramps in that area. Both directions of 465 back open after that closure that lasted several weeks. We know the westbound is going to close in early July for the same project, but for now we can enjoy 
the opening of 465 on the south side. And on this Thursday morning, it appears that people are a little bit shy because usually we would see more traffic on a Thursday people in this section. People are probably second guessing, They're thinking, is should it I open? do it? And I do it. So I think most folks this morning are using their alternate routes, yeah. thinking, well, maybe they weren't going to be done on time, but it is open. Yeah, the whole Come thing. Come on back. So Come on back. You can get right through that area. Yes, indeed. So that is good news for Southsiders like us, Kyle. How about that? That's right. You know, although one of the nice things about that being closed the last couple of weeks what? is that as I come off 465 toward Beach Grove, okay. I didn't have to merge with all that. Oh. Yeah, the scary merge. Okay. It's not my favorite. It is yeah. off the left side. Yeah. <laughs> But I know what you mean, Kyle. Kyle okay. Put that on the list. We'll it, ease it, back it, into that. Indot watches you all the time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now Indot will tweet at you saying, "Okay, Kyle, got it's you." The Kyle complaint. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just a, a concern. <laughs> All right, temperatures out there, not a concern for us this morning. We've got numbers that are in the 60s, 61 for you right now in Crawfordsville. Pair of sixes on the thermometer from Indy into Shelbyville. And there you can see upper 50s in Greenwood. Good morning to you in Johnson County, Castleton at 64. Satellite and radar out there this morning. We've got the clouds. And uh, even though you see some green showing up on radar, this is not making it to the ground. This is just some false radar echoes out there this morning. So we will have the clouds around and that keeps our temperatures pretty steady. Middle 60s here as we go to 7 a.m. We'll be around 68 at 9 o'clock this morning and on our way to highs that are not exactly very very summer like a little more spring like out there as we'll make it into the middle and upper 70s with those clouds. Thank you for that. The time now is 631 here on Good Morning Indiana. New this morning, Metro Police are investigating another shooting on the city's east side. Authorities say this one happened on the 100 block of North Linwood Avenue. The victim, we're told, is in stable condition at this hour. No other details have been provided. This shooting is different from the other story, which is breaking news there on Dearborn and Michigan. Police there busy on the east side on this Thursday morning. It is 631. This Pride Month, advocates here in Indianapolis want to draw attention to the disproportionate number of cases of domestic violence in the LGBTQ community. This is a serious issue. WRTV's Nico Panisi live this morning here in Studio 8 to break down those numbers. Nico, what do those numbers show? Good morning, Raphael. Yes, numbers show there are a lot of domestic violence cases in the LGBTQ community, more than in straight cis relationships. Now let's take a look at some of those numbers. For lesbian women and bisexual women, that's 44% and 61% of them respectively go through some form of domestic abuse. Now when you compare, compare that to heterosexual women at 35%, that's a big difference. And for men, it looks a little bit different. Look at these figures. Gay men don't experience it as much as heterosexual men, but bisexuals have the most cases of abuse among men. And when it comes to the transgender community, that number is significantly higher, with more than 50%. I spoke with indie based nonprofit Domestic Violence Network about why that might be. Everyone deserves to be in a safe relationship. Ash Rathwell is the training services manager at Domestic Violence Network. They go out into the community so, and have conversations with organizations, businesses, and universities about domestic violence. It's kind of sometimes swept under the rug or there's just a lot of misconceptions that can happen. One in three women and one in seven men will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. That's according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Rathwell says for LGBTQ folks, there are additional barriers. We see unique forms of abuse for members of the LGBTQ plus community. So being outed by the person causing harm, that person saying, well, if you leave me, I'm going to tell this person in your life that you're LGBTQ plus. Abuse could also look like a partner weaponizing a person's identity against them. When we're looking at the transgender community, that could look like refusing to use someone's correct pronouns or Dead naming them. Dead naming is the act of referring to a transgender or non-binary person by a name they used prior to transitioning. And finding a place to turn in crisis can be challenging. Especially if it's not a specifically LGBTQ plus organization. Um, there can be some fear in that. A lot of these organizations are doing a lot of work to make sure they're addressing this. One of them is local social services organization Coburn Place. Vice President of Development Julie Henson says LGBTQ domestic violence cases are underreported. Our services this for me? Is this an affirming organization or is this an organization that is going to out me, shame me, um, give me services that aren't designed for me? That's why Henson says Coburn Place makes an intentional effort to let survivors know they're queer affirming. We are clear that we serve everyone. 
So we serve uh, men, women, we serve trans people so on our website. We have really specific um, blatant, you know, it's like the third line on our website that's like, we serve you so that it's not a, it's not a guessing game. And advocates want me to remind you of possible warning signs of domestic abuse. That could look like your partner telling you that you never do anything right, showing extreme jealousy of your friends or time away from them, controlling your finances, pressuring you to have sex or perform sexual acts you're not comfortable with, or intimidating you with weapons like guns, knives, bats, or mace. And of course, if you need help, you can always call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233. We know that breaking the cycle is one of the first steps of people, but for every individual, Nico, it's different. So hopefully by you sharing this information, someone will see it and say, this is the day for me. That's definitely the hope. I mean, with these warning signs, folks may not even know that they're in these situations mm -hmm. of, of violence or abuse. So hopefully someone saw this and, and now they're able to recognize those signs. All right, Nico, thanks for your work on this story. More coming up here on Good Morning Indiana. A new lawsuit argues that Amazon is tricking its customers. We're going to share with you the basis behind these accusations and the company's response. Also on this Thursday, the chicken you buy in the future may not come from a farm. Say what? That you push to grow meat in labs and how this may benefit the environment. I want more information on this one. The time now is 6.35. You're watching Good Morning Indiana. Well, interest rates will likely go up again this year. So let's talk money. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell says more hikes are needed to control this ongoing inflation. He told a House committee on Wednesday that the country has a long way to go to get inflation back under 2%. The Fed, as you may recall, held off raising rates this month to examine the impact that those hikes have had on the banking industry as well as the overall economy. The IRS is catching up on backlogged tax returns. A new report says the agency cut down on 80% of excess filings. There were more than 13 million backlogged returns at the end of the 2022 tax filing season. A number has now dropped to just over 2 million. The report also says employees are picking up the phone more. Last year, just 11% of the calls were answered. That number has risen to 35% in 2023. A new lawsuit accuses Amazon of tricking you into signing up for Prime memberships. The Federal Trade Commission filed a complaint on Wednesday. It says that Amazon used deceptive practices to dupe consumers into automatically enrolling in Prime subscriptions. The FTC also accuses the company of making it hard for you to cancel that plan. Amazon calls the lawsuit concerning and disappointing and looks forward to defending itself in court. Well, now to that new chicken that could be <laughs> heading to your dinner plate. I don't like the sound of this So at all. producer Nolan wrote the script. It's in the prompter. We're going to read it as is, even though we have, we want to learn more about it, right? So I'm going to read it along. As ABC News reports, it's grown in a lab and it was just approved for sale right here in the good old USA. This morning, the USDA, for the first time, has approved lab-grown meat to be sold to the public. So that's where it all starts, just a few cells. Two cultivated meat producers now getting the green light to begin commercially selling their chicken products. Lab-grown meat is created using cells from living animals, such as fertilized eggs, which is then incubated and grown into large masses of meat in these stainless steel bioreactors. ABC's Devin Dwyer recently got a tour of California-based Upside Foods, where meat is cultivated. You're making chicken in there. Yeah, so so if you look at this, this is a approximately a 200 plus liter tank and we take cells from a chicken or an egg. It takes two weeks to grow the equivalent of one chicken, a thousand chickens or a hundred thousand chickens. So you're saying in this factory you can make more meat faster and cleaner than an average farmer? Well, ultimately, yes. The company says lab-grown meat could be instrumental in helping feed the world's growing population as meat demand rises, while using a fraction of the land and water of animal farming, helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Critics argue it's no silver bullet, with the potential for major socioeconomic implications and questions about how the meat is labeled. Many experts say more study is needed. More research and just caution. I, I think that a lot of companies are going to use or present the best case scenarios. As for how the lab grown chicken tastes. All right, my first bite of cultivated meat. It's chicken. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, New York. Mm.
Mm, I want more information, right? There's no plan to send this lab-grown meat to stores just yet because production costs are really high. So right now, p plans call for only limited partnerships with restaurants. We'll have to see where this goes. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, with anything else, any advancement, you just had to see where it goes. But I want to see more of the research. I am I already decided I'm not going to eat like, that. So. Raphael, stop talking. Follow yeah. the prompt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, coming up, chaos in Congress, how some lawmakers are trying to impeach President Biden, and how Republicans are uniting against a congressional Democrat. It's a change you could notice at your local grocery store later this year. The decision that aims to help you make healthier food choices on this Thursday morning. Our choice is the one and only Kyle Mounts. Listen, you are certified and bona fide. Hey, hey all right, <laughs> I am approved. I don't know about the USDA, but we'll go with 78 for your high today. A lot of cloud cover, and I'm saying there's a chance for a shower, but it isn't very high across central Indiana. And as we get a little closer to the weekend, this evening we've got animals and all that jazz out at the Indianapolis Zoo. Some comfortable temperatures in the low 70s with lots of clouds. We're going to look ahead to your first full weekend of summer, including the chance for some rain. It is 642. We'll be right back here on Good Morning Indiana. Welcome back. The House Ethics Committee is set to review a censure resolution against Democratic Representative Adam Schiff. Mr. Schiff is from California and he says the rare party line vote to censure him yesterday shows he did the right thing. His overall role in the first impeachment of the former president Donald Trump and the Russia probe. Democrats are voicing their objections to the move. For Republicans, the timing of the resolution is notable. Some in the GOP want to vote on impeaching President Biden this same week. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is trying to dissuade them in doing that. The GOP controlled Senate acquitted Mr. Trump in 2020 and did so again the following year after the House charged him with inciting the January 6th Capitol riot. It's a change you may notice the next time you go to the grocery store. This December, by the way, the FDA is developing new nutrition labels that will go on the front of packaged foods. The agency is hoping the information will be more clear and easy to understand so that consumers can make healthier choices. The FDA also believes the new labeling will encourage the food industry to develop healthier products that Americans will want to buy. The labels will exist in addition to the nutrition facts found on the back of those packaged foods. And by the way, I want to do a quick correction. The last time, of course, that the President Trump was in office, it was controlled by Democrats. So just keep that in mind. A little fact check there on this Thursday morning. Now time for 646, some weather facts. Rain, no rain, what do we got going on? Not a lot of rain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I that, ask you a question? Sure. When can we stop asking you about the rain? Like, like you know, we've been asking you every, every well, day this week, like, hey, Kyle, you know. <laughs> what about the rain? You say, every time you yeah. say to us, shut up, dude, no rain. So no. when can I ask you, hey, rain, you're going to say, it's coming. You know, uh, I think as we get Sunday and then Monday, okay. we should still have some rain. The thing is, we need a lot of it, okay. right? Because right. it's been several months that we've been dry. So um, definitely it will help any rain we can get. But the more organized rain, it looks like we've got a chance here as we go Sunday into Monday. Not much of a chance out there this morning with temperatures that have actually dipped into the upper 50s in Richmond. You're right at 60 degrees in Greencastle and it's 62 in Kokomo. Satellite and radar out there this morning. You can see all of the gray representing the clouds that we're going to have throughout the day. This green that's showing up, not exactly making it down to the ground, just some showers aloft. Here's a look at Truecast as we go through our Thursday and you can see that isolated shower chance here as we go to 2 o'clock this afternoon. Most of central Indiana not seeing a drop of rain again today, although more of us will see clouds than we've seen over the last couple of days. We've typically seen a little more sunshine for northwestern areas. Today with those mostly cloudy skies, you know that will kind of hamper any warming on temperatures. So we'll see those numbers getting into the lower 70s here at noon and then not rising too much more after that. Middle to upper 70s across much of the Hoosier state here, but we will find still some of the warmer air to the north and west. Lafayette, you get to 81 today, 77 in Kokomo, 74 in Anderson. The 80s really going to be limited to about the western third of central Indiana, 82 in Rockville calling for 78 in Indian, 76 in Shelbyville, and lower to middle 70s here for many communities across the southeastern portion of the state. And as we get to Sullivan, 81 for your high. 
Here's a look at the winds gusting today. Again, it's not going to be anything crazy, but still a little bit of a northeast breeze to contend with. And this evening for Victory Field, the Indians take into the field out there. We'll have mostly cloudy skies. First pitch temperature going to be very nice here in the upper 70s, 73 as we get to 10 o'clock this evening. Tomorrow's forecast, we're going to keep those clouds around. An isolated shower or storm as temperatures top out around 80 degrees. And I think tomorrow a slightly better chance for rain, but that is going to be primarily focused across the eastern half of central Indiana. So still going to be likely waiting on any rain around Crawfordsville. Here's a look at your extended forecast. Now we get to 88 on Saturday, a little steamy for the weekend, 87 on Sunday. There's that 40% chance for some showers and storms developing as we go through the day and holding on to some of those scattered storms into early next week. Lauren. All right, Kyle, taking it down here to the south side. This is a live look at I-465 and Harding Street. Hopefully we'll ease some traffic here on Harding Street. We've seen some backups, especially folks heading northbound towards the 465 ramps when we had that eastbound ramp system closed down. That's back open today as well as the eastbound I-465 traffic. Let's take a look at it from our live drive vehicle. All of those lanes reopened by 5 a.m. this morning as they had the lanes closed off for several weeks doing some drainage work and some lane work in that area. So you can see here traffic is pretty quiet actually traveling along the south side where it reopened. We'll keep you updated as the westbound direction set to close in July but for right now, enjoy the reopening. Enjoy it indeed as the summer season gets underway. Blood donations unfortunately are going down and officials from the Red Cross say it's common to see blood donations decline this time of year. The decrease blamed on summer travel and fewer blood drives like schools. They don't have them as much because they're closed right for the next several weeks. So what happens if blood isn't readily available? Health experts say it can lead to postponement of elective surgeries. Low blood donations are especially concerning for those with sickle cell disease, which impacts nearly 100,000 Americans. There is no widely available cure, and they often rely on regular blood transfusions to manage their pain and prevent life-threatening complications. Anyone interested in giving blood can schedule an appointment by going to their website, redcrossblood.org. Even if you're traveling this summer, you can type in your zip code and find a nearby blood drive if you wish to give in the community that you are visiting. Coming up on Good Morning America, a scam investigation into the world of AI. The fakes that you have to see and hear to believe. And major changes at TSA, what you need to know before you head out to the airport for that next flight. That and your top stories on this Thursday. Thursday morning right here on Good Morning Indiana. Right now on Good Morning Indiana. The time now is 654 here on Good Morning Indiana. Here's the information you need to get out the door by 7. So we are still following a deadly shooting investigation on Indy's east side. This is near Dearborn Street and Michigan Street. This is a live look at the scene. One victim was found there with injuries consistent of gunshot wounds and dead in the, at the scene. That person was an adult male in a vehicle. This remains an active investigation at this hour. We'll keep you updated as we get any new details. Residents on the south side raising some safety concerns about a proposed truck stop near their homes. The truck stop would be built there near South Harding Street and State Road 37. According to the proposal, the truck stops driveway would be in front of some houses on South Harding, which is also a two lane road. A report from the Metropolitan Development Commission says the area should not be rezoned to build the truck stop. The developer appealed that decision. Now a commission appointed by the city will decide. A decision is expected to come in the next month. Five minutes until seven. Next time you fly out of Indianapolis International Airport, you'll see some new technology at the TSA checkpoints. There you see it right there. New scanners will give agents a 3D image of what's inside of your carry-on bag. With the new technology, passengers no longer need to remove their laptops from their carry-on. In fact, airport officials say you, could, you should now put all of your personal property inside your carry-on luggage so that everything can be scanned at once with the new 3D technology. Indiana, by the way, is the first state to have the CT checkpoints at all of its airports, including Evansville, Fort Wayne, South Bend, and of course here in the capital city. Well, the city of Fishers once again delaying improvements along State Road 37 and 141st Street. The reason city officials 
officials say remains the rising costs and inflation. The 141st Street interchange is the last portion of that project that needs to be complete. Fishers recently announced plans to add a new community center and more apartments. Officials will now wait until next spring to seek a bidder to complete the State Road 37 project. The big news and the good news as you're heading out the door this morning, eastbound lanes of I-465 are all back open on the southwest and south sides. Crews were able to reopen that in stages and it was fully reopened by about 5 o'clock this morning. You can see traffic in the area is traveling up to speed. Let's get a check of our forecast with Kyle. Yeah, and this morning we've got very comfortable temperatures out Good. there. I'm ready to uh, cuddle up with this duo, though. We've got Apollo oh. and Tanner. <laughs> oh, don't they just look so soft and like, like a blanket right mm -hmm. there? All right, well, we've got temperatures for that morning walk that are in the mid-60s here. Mostly cloudy skies right on into the lunch hour at 73. And we're going to keep mostly cloudy skies for a good chunk of the day. Yes, we'll still see some sunshine as we're about to show you here in just a moment. But we've got numbers that are in in the mid to upper 70s for an afternoon high. So more of a spring feel here for your Thursday. And looking ahead to the next couple of days, including the weekend, there's a better chance for rain along with some summer heat on Sunday. We'll have about a 40% chance for some of those thunderstorms. Enjoy the sun while you can. We are always on on your website, WRTV.com. That's right. We hope you'll join us for Friday. Looking forward to that on what? Good Morning yes. Indiana. I know that's tomorrow, so we'll see you then. But first, enjoy today and that sunshine here out at IMS. We hope you have a good one.